Previously on Expose. When I look at a plant, I look at it like a terrorist. I look at when your guards are there. I look at where they sit. I look at when they sleep. My job is to figure out how to get there and how to get back without getting caught. When I case a joint, uh, I, like, I like to see what, what's the most vulnerable thing. There have been times I've walked past sleeping guards. Most of the time, they didn't even know I was there. He's not afraid to get arrested. Uh, he's not afraid to get pushed around. Here I am listening to a boom box in, in Atlanta. I was actually inside their, uh, their propane control room. He came into this office and said, I signed up for the National Guard. I said, you what? Uh, I was with a platoon for a while where I was a 50 caliber gunner. One of our jobs was to find out who was working in Al-Qaeda. Within a matter of days after getting out of the uniform, he's back running around the countryside. When I was driving around, I was still looking for IEDs. Stop! Stop! If you can melt a tank on the MSR, you can, you can open up a rail car pretty easily. Funding for Expose has been provided by Tribune Review reporter Carl Prime. The nine dead and 250 injured in 2005 in Graniteville, South Carolina, are a canary in a coal mine. The casualties all came from chlorine inhalation. It could have been much worse. There were 42 cars loaded with chlorine. Luckily, only one ruptured when the train crashed. It was an accident in a small town. Carl Prime wonders, what if it was a big town like Pittsburgh? And what if it was no accident? What I wanted to do was show our readers how vulnerable our infrastructure can be. If a terrorist wanted to use our own infrastructure against us, how would he do it? Uh, you know, I, I love the fact that Carl is that intense. That, that is probably the best word for him. He is really intense. You would be hard pressed to find an investigative reporter with a resume quite like Carl Prine's. In 2002 and 2003, Prine wrote groundbreaking stories about how he defeated security at hazardous chemical facilities across the country. His work helped inspire billions of dollars worth of security improvements across the industry, and eventually a federal law requiring security assessments and plans. In 2005, he set himself a different kind of task. He took a leave from his job and signed up for a tour of duty as an army gunner in Iraq. Deployed to treacherous Anbar province, he survived four separate attacks by improvised explosive device. Prine had only been home a few weeks from Iraq when he took on a new story, or as he calls it, a new mission. To examine the security of America's rail lines. What the, what the rail industry has been saying for a long time, and I heard this while I was doing my story, they didn't want to speak on the record about it, but they would say things like, um, well, you know, it's, it's impossible for an IED or for any bomb to open up a rail car. This is impossible. And uh, having been in Iraq and, and pulled bodies out of armored vehicles that had far more armor on them than, than a 90-ton rail car of chlorine, um, I guess I took that a little personally. Prine had learned that a handful of chemicals, anhydrous ammonia and chlorine, for example, could be effectively used as weapons if terrorists sabotaged the rail cars laden with them. Rail cars which rumble right through the heart of many American cities.
at the beginning of his investigation rather than turn to government officials or experts he asked the question he always asks himself how would a terrorist approach the problem when you want to talk to people on how they get close to trains that are supposed to be heavily protected and aren't I mean some of the best people to talk to are are hobos uh, people who homeless people still ride the rails what you do is you follow the trail of liquor bottles and beer cans Anybody home? to the place where usually the railroad is most vulnerable. There's a hobo way station. This is where they sleep and they jump the freight right here. When you come around the bend, it slows right there. So basically you can just sit here and wait till the right car comes along. They like the agriculture hopper cars. Whoa! <laughs> They're not going to like that. You have to adapt yourself. You know, cover and concealment is very important. And sneaky. You're going on a patrol. This is just like in, in the Army or the Marine Corps. This is like a hasty ambush. This one of the interesting things about Al-Qaeda. They will use our transportation infrastructure against us. They did this on 9-11. They chose airplanes. But what if they wanted to choose trains, like they did in Madrid? What if they want to release millions of pounds of, of chemicals. Well, this is almost the perfect place to do it. It's like a duck blind. Uh, hey, Scott. Prine's reporting took him from the hobo underground to a little known government agency, the Federal Railroad Administration. The FRA, as it's known, monitors and regulates America's rail transportation network. Through a Freedom of Information Act request, the reporter learned that when it came to assessing the terror threat, the FRA was doing its job and doing it well. It had successfully identified hundreds of sites that were deficient in security. This is a refinery in Contra Costa County. Failed to uh, develop and adhere to a security plan. This is one in Batavia, New York. Never went there. I don't even know where Batavia, New York is, although I'm sure it's a very lovely place. I came away just flabbergasted that, that these guys had done so many inspections uh, feral gas in New Jersey. Yeah, I got into this one. They were taking this job very seriously. They were going out all over the country and they were saying, this rail yard does not have a plan. This rail yard hasn't done any security. They were doing a great job. So I thought, well, but is anybody listening to them? Is anybody listening to the, to the li tiny FRA? So I, I took this, this roadmap they had given me, this data-rich roadmap, and I, I just wanted to see, did the companies do much that would keep an intruder away from their hazardous materials. With the Federal Railroad Administration roadmap of security defects in hand, Prine was ready to hit the road. But he felt he needed a symbol to communicate to his readers the urgency of what he was writing about. He decided he would visit vulnerable trains, leave his business card, and ask the reader to imagine if it were a bomb. We did that in uh, New Jersey. We went, then we went to Georgia and Atlanta, then Seattle, and down through Oregon to the San Francisco Bay Area, and then to Las Vegas. Prine chose to focus primarily on rail yards near major cities. He was motivated by a chilling document he had obtained through an anonymous source, a Homeland Security disaster planning scenario. It estimates that should a terrorist bomb chlorine tankers near a metropolis like Las Vegas, over 17,000 people would die. We returned with Prine to Las Vegas. Some of the Al-Qaeda terrorists who attacked Manhattan and Washington, D.C. on 9-11 came here. Maybe they were scouting it out like I was. The rail lines, they vein this place. They're, they're everywhere. You're an artery that runs parallel to the strip. What, what, what does Las Vegas symbolize? It symbolizes the same thing to Al-Qaeda that it does to us. It's bustling. It's built on lust, money, greed skin, and it's all here. When Prine is out on one of his missions to get near a chemical train, he first performs a costume change. I like to blend in when I'm on a stakeout. The, the, the idea um, is that I look as much like the uh, 
the area uh, as possible. If I were staking out a bank, I'd dress like a banker. If I were staking out a, a law firm, I'd look like a lawyer. Uh, in this case, I'm staking out a construction site, so I want to look like a construction worker. I call it hiding in the open because you basically are there and no one ever asks you what you're doing. When he first came to Vegas in October of 2006, Prine waltzed right up to chlorine tankers, tagged them with his business card, and snapped these photos as he went. Prine's 06 mission also included a visit to a small California city surrounded by petroleum refineries, including those storing liquid petroleum gas, LPG. He took expose there, too. Uh, welcome to Martinez, California, home to two of the world's largest petroleum refineries. It's close to Oakland and San Francisco. An attack on the liquid petroleum gas that was here would create these huge fireballs. Like the one that hit Crescent City, Illinois in the 1970s. It actually shot rail cars 100 feet in the air. It speared one of them through, through three buildings. It injured 60 firefighters and basically burned for days after that. When I was casing it out, I, my, my original idea was, well, I'll go into Shell. But they had this great security. I mean, they had roving patrols and they had guards and they had... Uh, cameras everywhere and, and barbed wire and even though I, I saw some places where I thought I could get in um, I figured if I did I'd, there'd be this swarm and <laughs> Shell SWAT team would come and take me out. Once it once it exits the gate at Shell where they have this great security it's up to Union Pacific to control it but Union Pacific is it stretches over thousands and thousands and thousands of miles and they have all this LPG they can't control it everywhere Prine wanted to show us where he had symbolically tagged explosive tanker cars before and to see for himself if security had improved. It hadn't. He pointed out to us something that has startled him all over the country. Rail lines are being used as de facto storage areas. Tanker cars like these sit idle for hours, sometimes days. But most of the time, you just go and you put your, your card in, in the placard. The card is a surrogate. It's just letting them know, if I had been a terrorist, this thing would have been blown up. With his collection of toxic snapshots and evidence of lax security from coast to coast, Prine headed back to Pittsburgh to prepare to publish. Carl came and started talking to me about the project on a Sunday, and I thought that was really weird because it's, you know, Sunday, nobody really comes in and does a whole heck of a lot of major work, so I knew he was really dedicated to the story. Prine was developing a picture of sprawling, widespread vulnerabilities on U.S. rail lines, but he couldn't convey the vastness, the magnitude of the problem with words alone. We started out with uh, just a general map of the U.S. It was a topographic map. The color wasn't too good and it was a little bit much when we started to add the train lines. Um, the biggest thing that we wanted to make sure was that the color of the topography would not interfere with the trains that were going to be shown on the map. The map showed over 150,000 miles of U.S. rail lines and how thousands of chemical trains go right through major cities. Cleveland jumped out at me initially because I grew up in Cleveland and seeing exactly how many trains are around that area and how many trains are around New Jersey where I uh, have family travel frequently, it was kind of, you know, wow, if something were to happen, exactly how safe is my family? How safe am I? In January 2007, after a six-month investigation including months on the road, Prine published the results of his undercover mission. He had provocatively left his business card on chemical rail cars in Seattle, the San Francisco Bay Area, Las Vegas, Atlanta, Pittsburgh, and various places in New Jersey. Once again, Carl Prine had demonstrated unfettered access to huge amounts of toxic chemicals, which could be used as weapons of mass destruction by terrorists. In Washington, Senator Joseph Biden of Delaware commended Prine's reporting as a public service, saying Prine had uncovered a criminal tragedy waiting to happen. As Carl Prime showed, you can walk into a freight yard, and where he put his card, 
you could put plastique that you could remotely detonate in a chlorine gas tanker or a propane gas car going through the bowels of Philadelphia or New York City or Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles, California. I went to the, the, the Naval Research Institute, the best scientists we have. I said, what would happen if somebody stuck plastique like Carl stuck his car on a chlorine gas tanker car and it was remotely detonated? They said up to 100,000 people could die in a populated area. But not everyone was on Carl Prine's side. This is the voice of Pittsburgh. News talking with Pittsburgh Tribune investigative reporter Carl Prine. Terror on the tracks. How easy it is for a terrorist to blow up tank cars, refineries. You're sending out an invitation to terrorists to go ahead and do something. If they haven't already thought of this on their own, You've outlined a plan for Suicide them. bombers. These guys could just hop on and ride until it's time to uh, say Allah Akbar and visit the Virgin. I just think sometimes the news media gives too much information out. You're just giving them ideas that they might not have thought about. In the wake of Prine's investigation, the response from the rail industry was chilly, to say the least. The spokesman for Union Pacific simply told the Trib, our only statement is that we believe what you did is dangerous, and we strongly encourage people to stay away from railroad tracks. More outspoken was Henry Posner, chairman of a Pittsburgh-based rail company which runs train lines from Chicago to South America. He wrote to the Trib, accusing the paper of profiting from the promotion of hysteria. Journalists do not make money by telling the story about how everything is fine. Hysteria sells newspapers. Carl Prine says that trains can be hijacked. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He does, why doesn't he know what he's talking about? Be, 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 the, if a train could be hijacked, uh, the question becomes, where would you go with the train? And you really can't go very far uh, because the uh, main lines are controlled for the most part by centralized dispatching. And uh, I think the, the logistics of hijacking a train are extremely complicated and uh, it would be very, very difficult as compared to hijacking a truck. Well, you, you can't steal a train and divert it. Well, why the hell would you need to? <laughs> what, what better target would you want? <laughs> you have the federal building, the federal court building, the convention center, right in the middle of downtown Pittsburgh. Divert it? Hell, you're, you're doing them a favor. <laughs> you're bringing it right to where they want it to be. In all, the Trib received over 300 responses to Carl Prine's Terror on the Tracks series. Prine estimates that 80% of the mail runs against him. Uh, my philosophy is to uh, write back to every single person who writes to me, and if they call and leave a phone number, I call them back. I've had people who give me death threats, I'll still call them back if they leave a number. But not everyone leaves a callback number or address, like one anonymous correspondent who wished Carl Prine dead. I would welcome the news that somebody ventilated him during one of his unauthorized undercover trespassing adventures. There's a lot of things that can be done without leaving any trails. Uh, several people have uh, come up to me and said, you know, we don't agree with the work you're doing. Um, we think that you are helping Al-Qaeda. Whenever you do these kinds of stories, there's always somebody, and sometimes a lot of somebodies who say, you shouldn't have done this, you, you're telling our enemies how to attack us. But I think anybody who looks at 9-11 or looks at the, the events that have taken place in this country and other countries since then, who thinks that Al-Qaeda needs an American newspaper, an American TV station to tell them how to attack us, doesn't understand what's going on. It takes a lot to really bother me, but when people question my patriotism, that actually does get to me. My ass was in Iraq last year trading rounds with al-Qaeda, and they were sitting in their uh, living room in forced recliner enjoying uh, the television. You know, the terrorists don't need an American newspaper to tell them what to do, but the American people need American newspapers to tell them where and how they're vulnerable, because that's probably the best way they're ever going to get unvulnerable. Prine worries the U.S. is getting more vulnerable every day. He's been following news reports that terrorists, at least in Iraq, have added chlorine gas to their arsenal. 
This is an ominous and frightening development. There were three chlorine bomb explosions in Iraq last month, three more this weekend. At least eight were killed, as we've reported. And most reve revealingly, most sinisterly, 350 people were seriously injured. Chlorine gas, if you inhale just a little bit of it, can kill you and uh, is almost certain to cause nasty damage to your throat or your lungs. If there's anything that the terrorists are trying to teach us in Iraq by blowing up chlorine tank trucks, it's, it is this, don't let major chlorine and other kinds of poison gas cargoes come through your major cities. Fred Millar is a Washington, D.C. activist and a source for Carl Prine. He's lobbying city councils across the country to reroute trains carrying the most dangerous chemicals. This book is the Professional Railroad Atlas of North America. It has a, a eight and a half by 11 page size maps of all the states in the country. And it shows you plenty of alternative rail lines that don't go through major target cities. You can either go through Chicago or use a non-target route well south of our major Great Lake cities. In a time of terrorism concern, Going through Chicago or going around your major target cities is an enormous difference in terrorism risk. A lot of states are now looking at it. Nevada, California. A lot of states are taking a look and they're saying, wait a minute, wh why do we have to have hazardous materials stored in downtown Las Vegas? Why can't we stick it out in the desert someplace? So if a terrorist blew it up, it would just kill a bunch of jackrabbits. Where is the likely target? Where are people On the floor of the U.S. Terror? Senate, Joe Biden made an impassioned plea for better rail security. Insurgents in Iraq are using chlorine in their attacks on civilians. And there's little doubt that terrorists who are targeting us here at home aren't paying attention. I've actually had people say to me, look, Joe, you can't, you can't possibly protect every mile of rail in America. So why do we try? I said, I'm not trying to protect every mile in America. But I'm trying to protect the places where you know our intelligence agency. We have evidence that, that al-Qaeda and terrorist groups understand that they could do massive damage. We can diminish significantly the prospect of them being able to do that by taking prudent action. In March 2007, Biden proposed an amendment to a security bill calling for more rail police, rerouting away from major cities, and replacing lethal chemicals with safer alternatives. What would happen if one of these 90-ton chlorine gas tanker cars exploded? That's an, that is an actual photograph. Look where this tanker is sitting. These buildings look familiar to y'all. Biden could not overcome stiff opposition from the rail and chemical industries. His amendment was voted down. For his part, Carl Prine says he doesn't endorse any specific piece of legislation. He does endorse open discussion and freedom of information. That's why he and the TRIB painstakingly turned a mountain of data into a searchable database. Want to find out if your home is vulnerable? Type in your zip code. We decided to put all this information online so that anybody could use it because we believe that the data we use should be as open as possible to the public. If this database came from a public domain, from, a ta from an agency taxpayers paid for, taxpayers have a right to see that data. The real surprise in our stories has been that we've had more hits on the, uh, on the search engine that, that takes people to all these documents than we have had on the stories themselves. There is one problem with the TRIBS database. It only has data up through 2005. Carl Prine is trying to get up-to-date information with a Freedom of Information Act request. He says he's been waiting a year for an answer. People want to see what government is doing in their name and their community. And when industry fails them, when they don't plan, when they don't train their workers, they want to see that. I think they have a right to see it. Rail security is a footnote to a much larger question. What direction are we moving as our country? What are we going to give up in a free society? What could happen if we don't do certain things? Good morning, this is Ian Thompson uh, over at Standing Stone Consulting. I wanted to thank you for your article on uh, train security. I thought it was uh, right on target. We do counterterrorism for a living, and I'm glad that you uh, 
that that you said that. Uh, hello, Mr. Thompson. How you doing? Fine, fine. I, I, I got your message, and it's, it's this is my first chance to talk, call you back. I, I'll be honest with you, I don't get that many uh, ni nice, uh, <laughs> nice messages about this. Uh, <laughs> Expose has been provided by